and welcome to Gateway Online. I'm Kylie and we're really happy that you're here with us. If it's your first time here, go ahead and fill out our digital connection card and get connected to what's been happening here at Gateway. We exist to love God, love others, and make disciples. If you need prayer or you know someone else who needs prayer, please let us know and we will be praying for you. You'll be able to access our digital connection card at gatewaycc.org slash card or you can click the link which will be in the chat below. Pastor Randy will be continuing our series in the book of James, but before we get into that, let's start off with some worship.
your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. In your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord. Nothing. 
these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended and rolled empty handed but not forsaken how been set free See you. 
My name is Kylie and we're really happy that you're here. The message is going to begin soon, but before that, I want to encourage you to grab the link and you can share it with a friend. Today, Pastor Randy will be continuing our series in the book of James. And if you'd like to take notes or if you want the devotions that will go with the message, you can find them at gatewaycc.org notes. We're really glad to be able to bring you Gateway Online and a great way to partner with us is by giving online. You can do that at gatewaycc.org give and don't forget that after this, we have our little kids service on Facebook at 10 a.m. Now let's check out Pastor Randy's message. Welcome everyone to Church Online. The Lord willing, we're still gonna be out in the parking lot, but very soon we're gonna be inside. I'm taping this several weeks in advance. So today I know is scheduled to be November the 8th. I love the number eight. Noah was the eighth person that God saved from the flood. God gave me that number a long time ago. So I'm excited for this Sunday, as really I am every Sunday. But this is the Sunday after the election. And so I'm sure that the world is just living in peace, or let me say, I'm sure the world needs peace. Today, we're going to be focusing on James chapter 3 and looking at our series of faith that works when life doesn't. Today's topic, which I think is very apropos, is a faith that plants seeds of peace. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the world needs you. I mean, God has left you here with purpose and reason. And there are people in your life that God wants to use you to plant seeds of peace. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, maybe you go by the name of Christian, or maybe you let people know that you're born again, or you know, just a follower of Jesus, a disciple. You know, there's a lot of terms that the Bible uses for people who walk with God. In the book of Acts, when the, when the church was very first founded, when the fire came down in Acts chapter 2, Jesus had gone to heaven, and when he went up to heaven, the fire of the Holy Spirit came down on the church, and people were known by the term the way. The way was kind of how people were, were referred to as followers of Jesus because they lived their life in such a way that people associated them with being like Jesus. In Acts chapter 11, uh, the Christians were very, for the first time, referred to as Christians, which literally means like Christ or little Christians. So there's a lot of terms that people associate with being followers of Jesus. Well, here's another one. In uh, Matthew chapter 5, the Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. There's another term that people might associate with people who follow Jesus, a peacemaker. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd, I'd rather be known as a peacemaker, wouldn't you? That's a lot better than being known as a troublemaker, I think. And in our world of upheaval and the riots and the unrest and everything that we've just gone through with the election and the politics... We need people of peace. God wants you and he wants me to be a, a, a peacemaker. I think it's really relevant as we look at today's teaching. So I have six seeds of faith that we can see in this section of scripture in James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Let's get in there. So James 3, 13 says, If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works, with the humility that comes from wisdom. So true wisdom is shown by living an honorable life. People can literally see it in your lifestyle. People will feel it in the way that you interact with them. And they will see you do good works with humility. Maybe you do something to bless them. Maybe you reach out to one of your neighbors during this pandemic and you bless them. So they can see it. Verse 14. But... If you are bitterly jealous, and if there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. Now, we see this in politics. We see this in the news all the time. You might see it in your neighbors. I mean, you know, there are people, maybe even in your family, 
people you work with. There's people that cover up the truth with boasting and lying. There's just all kind of bad stuff there. Uh, our culture is really full of it. You probably see this on social media a lot. Some people, the only the only pictures they ever post are perfect pictures, right? They're always happy. There's always this, you know, don't they ever have a down day? Don't they, doesn't a meal ever come out bad, you know? So, you know, we have a lot of this in our behavior. Let me just tell you this when it comes to boasting and lying. That kind of behavior does not build healthy friendships or healthy relationships. Lying especially creates division. It hurts. It destroys. And it gets worse. Verses 15 and 16. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things on are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil. Notice this, evil of every kind. We see so much of this in our world. Man, it's not the kind of place that we want to raise our kids or our grandkids, right? Honestly, it's just not the place we want to live in either. As followers of Jesus, we need to make sure we are not contributing to that kind of chaos. Instead, we need to make a positive difference. Literally like salt in a culture, preserving the sanctity of life and the peace, preserving uh, the kind of honor and respect amongst people that I think everyone really does want. Well, here are six seeds of peace that you can plant so that you have peaceful relationships. And we find this in James chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. It says, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times. It's willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. There's the title of the sermon right there. Verse 18, those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace. And verse 17 gave us six seeds that we can plant. And and, and in fact, just just notice, you, you will plant seeds of peace. In other words, here's how you can be a peacemaker. Verse, and the first one is this. Wisdom has moral integrity, moral purity, okay? But the it says in verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first of all, of most importance. Let's start with this one. It's first of all, pure. Matthew 5, 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. God is into purity. He is a holy God and your lifestyle matters to God. Jesus said, be holy for he is holy for your heavenly father is holy. So be pure with your morals. Be pure in your thought life. Be pure in your motives. In fact, be pure in your words. Proverbs Proverbs 15, 26 says, the Lord detests the thoughts of the wicked. But those of the pure are pleasing to him. The purity of your words matters to God. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Don't send a mixed message. Don't be a hypocrite. No, say what you mean and mean what you say. God hates lies and deceptions. Satan is a father of lies. Let's not be like him. Let me tell you something about Dr. Leonard Keeler. Now, Some of you, maybe every one of you, are going to think, well, why would you want to mention Dr. Leonard Keeler? You probably don't know who he is, but you do know who what he invented. Dr. Leonard Keeler invented the lie detector. And after testing over 2,000 people, he concluded, every human being is by nature dishonest. Check about <laughs> every human being is by nature dishonest. We are naturally dishonest. God doesn't want us to stay that way. So we need to make a change. Ephesians chapter four, verse 15 says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way and more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. 
growing in every way more and more like Christ. Do you understand that? Growing. When you come to Jesus, he saves you. But he doesn't want you to stay that way. He wants you to get more and more. Here a little bit, there a little bit, every single day. Listen, when we come to Jesus, I know that I had certain bad habits in my life. You know, playing football, I had a bad habit of saying bad words. And you know, you don't just like never just say another bad word in your life when you decide to live for Jesus. I have had to work on that. You know, it, your thought life, your words, your the habits that we form, sometimes to undo a habit takes some work. You have to retrain yourself. That's why in Romans chapter 12, it says you've got to go to the altar and then you have to be transformed by the renewing of your thoughts. So listen, if you are used to, if it's a habit in your life to say, you know, lies, tell lies and deceptions when people ask you things, you can change that with God's help, but you do have to commit to own when you say something wrong or that that's a lie, a deception. Start owning that. Excuse me. You know what? I said that I need to just apologize. That was not accurate. That wasn't the truth. Let me do better here. You can get better with Christ's help. And listen, you can't build trust in a relationship with lies. Speaking the truth in love and respect can build trust in your relationships. Let's do that. It is wise for you to refuse to compromise your moral integrity. Let's learn to speak the truth in love. Number one. Number two, wisdom promotes peace. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from from above is first of all pure, but it is also peace-loving. Wouldn't you rather have peace than have a fight? One of the things that peacemakers do is avoid fights and arguments whenever possible. When you try to win a fight, somebody's got to lose. So if you're in a fight or an argument with someone that you really care about and you really love, you don't want to make them a loser. You need to learn to talk this stuff over in a way where you find a common solution to the situation instead of somebody's got to win, which means you got to lose. Listen, I get this. Oh, I am like this. If you're competitive and you're like me, you know, even without intentionally trying, you make other people have to be losers. We don't want that. That's not good. Proverbs 20 verse 3 says, avoiding a fight is a mark of honor. Only fools insist on quarreling. Any fool can start a fight, but it takes wisdom to avoid one. And that is a mark of honor and wisdom. There's kind of three root causes to fighting, comparing, condemning, or contradicting. So if you do those, you're asking for a fight. William James, a very famous psychologist, said, Wisdom is the art of knowing what to overlook. So if you're in an argument, sometimes it's best to overlook some of the details that somebody might bring up. You don't have to say, oh, that's wrong. You know, love covers over a multitude of inaccuracies or sins. So it, listen, if I'm wise, I will learn to plant seeds of peace. I won't compromise my moral integrity and I won't antagonize your anger. Number two, wisdom promotes peace. All right, number three. Wisdom is gentle with your feelings. James 3.17, but the, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, also peace-loving. And it goes on to say it's gentle at all times, especially when you're in a discussion passionately. We really need to learn to be gentle and considerate of other people's feelings. Man, I get so passionate about truth but I can stomp on people's feelings. I know that about me. So I'm, Lord, help me to be better. We can be better at this, people. Even if we get the facts wrong, see, or what if we get the facts, in fact, right, we need to be considerate of other people's reality and their feelings. Because their feelings, even if they're wrong about the facts, are real. So wisdom means that we're considerate of how they feel and, and especially when we're interacting with them. Romans 15 says, we who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please himself. As the scriptures say, 
The insult of those who insult you, O God, have fallen, O God, have fallen on me. See, that's love in action. That's Christ-like. What would Jesus do? He would be gentle. He would feel your pain. Galatians 6.2 says, share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Be said it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So let's review. If you really want to be a peacemaker in this world or how about in your home or on your job or with your family, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers are wise in their relationships. They're going to they're going to be pure. They're going to they're they're going to be committed to moral integrity. They're going to be committed to telling the truth. Okay, that's what they're going to do. And number four, wisdom will be open to your suggestions of reason. James three seventeen says, "Real wisdom is not defensive." Now, the Greek word here is actually used only one time in the entire New Testament, and this idea here in this word when it says the wisdom is reasonable, is is that it actually is your mind is open to reason. All right? I am committed to the truth. Man, I will, I really, really can get passionate about truth. And that's where I can tend to stomp on people when I, I, I believe I'm defending truth and I'm seeking truth, right? I'm all about truth. Jesus said I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But I also know I'm not always right. So here I am trying to defend the truth. Well, what about if I'm wrong? Or what about if I'm right? I should, at the very least, be open to the possibility I'm wrong about this so that I can defend truth, but in a gentle way. I'm telling you something I'm trying to learn, even as I preach this, right? So we can be open to reason. Don't you want to be right? Don't you want to be in the truth, right? So look, don't be afraid of the truth, man. Let's be truth seekers. And and the Bible says it's wisdom to have your mind open to reason. So you need to be open to discussion. Uh, Oh my goodness, you know, when I research about stuff, I I research a lot. And then I research one side, the other side, the in-between side, and try to think it through, whether it's a biblical thing or a political thing or a cultural thing or historical thing or a sports thing. I try to do my research. I know I'm not perfect in that, but I really do make an effort to do that. Why? I'm looking for truth. If all you ever do is just look at one point of view, how are you going to know for sure? So, I mean, it's hard on me, but even in the politics thing, I, I, I look at the extreme left. I look at the extreme right, which I'm not either of those. But man, see, I want to be like Jesus. And I want to be in the truth when it comes to these issues, especially when it deals with people. So you got to be open minded about these things. Don't just be stubborn about your own ideas. Listen, nobody, unless your name is Jesus Christ, is right all of the time. So even if you are mostly right, be open to those few times when you're not and let others help you, okay? Listen, all great leaders are great learners. So let's learn and let's get better together. Proverbs twelve fifteen says, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others, all right? Can your friends reason with you, my friend? Can your spouse reason with you? Can your kids, can your coworkers? Let's be open to reason because we'll be better if we are. It's wisdom. Number five, Wisdom is full of mercy and good deeds. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. See, that's way better than just always emphasizing somebody else's mistakes. Are you quick to point out what's wrong with everything in your home or at your work or in your church? Do you jump on every single mistake and error? Do you feel duty bound to remind people what didn't work, right? Are you picky, picky, picky about everything? Do you bring up the past over and over and over again? Do you have to get historical about all of the people's failings around you? Listen, get over that. Some critique is useful, but if you're just coming across as a negative critic all the time, it is going to take people down. Mercy is a mark of wisdom. Mercy is actually giving the people you love, or maybe the people that you don't even like so much, but mercy is giving people what they need 
not what they deserve. When somebody stumbles, don't just judge them, encourage them. Everyone makes mistakes. Mercy is treating people the way God really treats you. Did you get that? When you have mercy on someone else, you're really treating them the way God treats you because his mercies are renewed every single day. I need them, don't you? Let's learn to give it to other people as well. Treat them how you want to be treated. Proverbs 17, 9 says in the Living Translation, love forgets mistakes. Nagging about them parts the very best of friends. Love forgets mistakes. That's what is wise to do in a relationship. Forget the mistakes, okay? If you're married, one of the devil's tactics is to remind us of our loved one's failures, even after we have forgiven them. Why? He's trying to create a wound that is incurable, that is poison and toxic, because he's trying to poison and, t- and have your relationship be divided. Satan hates people that love each other. He's against love. He doesn't like that, right? He's against everything that's good. And I mean, that's what he does, and he's very effective at it. You got to know that's what he wants to do in your marriage and with your kids. He wants to do that. He wants you to hate your country. I mean, he just, he's a hateful being. Listen, we got to fight that. So when Satan comes to you, maybe, maybe you're in one of those passionate discussions with somebody that you really love and care about. And all of a sudden he starts reminding you of the past and what, oh, you did it again. Oh, there you go again. And you always do that, right? And he's trying to stir up trouble with the people that you love the most. And he goes, you remember the time they did such and such and so and so to you? When he does that the next time, here's something you can use. Satan comes to you. He starts telling you that stuff that happened in the past. And you can say, whoa, wait a minute, time out. Do I remember that? No. As a matter of fact, I distinctly remember forgetting that. How about that? He's trying to remind you of somebody else's failure. There they go again, but they're a Christian or they're somebody, they're your family and you love them and you can tell Satan, you know what? No, as a matter of fact, I distinctly remember forgetting that. Mercy and forgiveness allow you to do that. You don't have to be a captive of your past. You can learn to be like Jesus and forgive and let it go. All right. By the way, if you were the one that did the wrong, let's learn from that. Not repeat it. That's all good stuff, too. All right. Proverbs 15, 4 says, Gentle words are a tree of life. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Now, what do you need to stop bringing up with that person in a relationship that is not helping you? Because you need to let that go. Well, the Holy Spirit can help you. Let it go. All right. Last one. Number six, wisdom celebrates diversity. James 3.17, but the wisdom that is is from above is first of all pure. It's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good good deeds, and it shows no favoritism. It's always sincere. See, it, it doesn't despise the differences that we have. It shows no favorites. It celebrates diversity. All right. One of the biggest sources of conflicts in in, in relationships is when we expect everyone to think just like we do, act just like we act, like just what we like, right? No, there is wonderful joy in diversity. Let me tell you something. As a sports fanatic, I've liked sports for years. I'm Kind of soured on them recently. You know, everything is shut down and everything. But still, right now when I'm taping this, the Dodgers are in the World Series, right? And one of the things about sports and baseball in particular, it, when you have friends that are from San Diego or San Francisco or different parts of the world, I have got friends from New York. When you've got friends that are believers in Christ, especially, you're really close to, you love these people. And when they're from a different city, a lot of these people, if they're baseball fans, guess what? They'll be... Yankee fans, which there's like nothing worse than that. But then you got Giant fans, you got Padre fans, you've got Angel fans, you got Dodger fans, right? And part of the joy when when you do it right is that in sports there are rivalries. 
and honestly, there's like no better rival uh, rivalries in, in, in baseball than like the Dodgers and the Giants or the Dodgers and the Yankees, unless maybe it's the Yankees and the Red Sox. But there are these rivalries and you root for your team. And when they win, you're so happy. And when they lose, you, you really have a harpoon in your heart. But it's in good fun. I live in, in Northern California now, and a lot of people in our church, they're all died in the world Giants fans. I'm Christian enough that I actually rejoice when the, Dodgers, when the Giants won three World Series this last decade. None of them are rejoicing that the Dodgers are in the World Series now, but it's all in good fun in nature, I, I think. We can celebrate diversity. And when there are these differences of opinion, or this different, like, love for a sports team, for instance, that really doesn't make any difference at all. Have fun with it. You know what? In, in, in church, there are some people believe that Jesus, oh, he's going to come this year. Some people believe, when I was growing up, they believed he was going to come 50 years ago. He didn't. Uh, there are people who think, well, he's going to come before the next election. Well, that's that's already passed when I, when I tape this. It's two weeks from when I tape this right now. Well, see, we don't know this stuff, right? If you get divisive about, you know, did you sing this song fast, too fast or too slow? Or you're not singing enough hymns or, you, or we don't we don't like the contemporary stuff. When you start getting divisive about when Jesus is going to come, about the color of the carpet, about, well, we don't like those donuts. Let, let's have healthier snacks. When you start getting divisive about stuff that really isn't an essential thing to get divisive about, you're just being divisive. And Satan is using you, and it's not good. We need to look at each other and celebrate our uniqueness, okay? God has made us all unique. God loves our differences. In music, did you know that different notes are what create harmony? In the same chord, we want to be all of one accord. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17 says, Respect everyone and love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God and respect the king. Well, I'm taping this several, well, actually two and a half weeks before, maybe three weeks before the election. Yeah, three weeks before the election. But you know what? Somebody's going to win. Eventually, they're going to declare a winner on this election. And half of the country or so is going to be really upset about it. They're going to be in deep mourning. I don't know who you're going to vote for. <laughs> I'd like to vote for King Jesus because he's the only guy I really trust when it comes to this stuff. But oh, God bless America. I, I want the best for our country. I want the best for you and I want the best for me. I want to be able to worship in spirit and truth. I want the liberty. I don't want the government telling me what to do. Boy, they're doing a lot of that in California. But you know what? Romans 15, 7 says, Therefore, accept each other, just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. How do I get that wisdom? Colossians 2, 3 says, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence as they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Did you get that? See, the key to wisdom is not a principle, it's a person. It's Jesus Christ. And whatever you need, whatever you, whenever you need wisdom, He can supply it for you. If you want peace in your relationships, Jesus can help you, right? He's the Prince of Peace. You need to get Jesus into your life. You need to get Him on the throne of your heart. You need, and, and you know what? If you've not done that, I did that when I was a kid. And I, I continue to renew that commitment. I need to. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that right now. If you've got bad relationships in your life that you want to get better, if you need God's wisdom to help you sow seeds of peace in your relationships, let's do it together right now. Would you pray with me? Dear God, I need your wisdom. You need to say that, just pray that in your heart. Oh, Heavenly Father, we need wisdom. I, you know, there's some people, sometimes I make a mess in my relationships, even when I'm trying to do the right thing. Oh, God, the messes that I make, I pray that you would help heal them, that you would help me be a better person, that you would help me have wisdom and sow seeds of peace in my relationships instead of seeds of conflict or tension. 
Oh God, I want to be a peacemaker and not a troublemaker. But to do that, I need your wisdom. And, and friend, if you've never invited Jesus to sit on the throne of your heart, it, let's do that right now. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask that you would come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, wash me clean of my sins, and Lord, help me to break the bad habits in my life that have caused me to be destructive in my relationships instead of building relationships of trust. Lord, help me to live a life that pleases you. And Lord, help me to live a life that sows seeds of reconciliation and peace and trust and love in my relationships. Father, help me to love you more and more each day so that I'm in a position filled with your love to love others in my life the way you love me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. In case you didn't know, this past week was a very important week in our country. The presidential election was held and there were candidates on the ballot that had differing ideas and plans on how the country should be run. But my friends, remember who is in control. Leaders have been elected and or appointed down through the years, but we have the ultimate example of leadership, Jesus Christ. He was a servant leader that led by example and had compassion for people. As we take in the events from this past week, let us continue to follow the example of Christ by loving our neighbor as ourselves. We can be sure that some disappointment and possibly some anger will be expressed during this time, but we must not forget that love never fails. So again, my friends, no matter the outcome of this election, remember who is in control. Let us take this moment to remember the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross for us, and then we will partake of communion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Please partake. And after the same manner, he also took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Please partake. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for this country, for the people here in this country, God. And Again, we've had a lot of things that have been going on this past week, but God, let us remember that you are in control. Give us peace through the storms and the, just the things that are going on, even far above the election, God, uh, pandemics and uh, weather and all these other things that are going on here and across the world. God, again, you have everything under control. So give us peace and we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you made for us. These things we ask in Jesus name. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet. 
accepted Jesus into your heart today, let us know about it. You can fill out our digital connection card at gatewaycc.org slash card, and one of our pastors will be able to encourage you and can get you a Bible. I just want to thank you guys for partnering with us here at Gateway. Your generosity is able to make an impact in our community. And if you want to learn more about partnering with us through giving, you can do that at gatewaycc.org slash give. And we will see you next week.